Welcome everyone. Let's go ahead. Why don't we stand together? Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for another beautiful day you gave us and the opportunity to come together with your people and sing your praises, worship together, worship you together. And so we do focus our attention on you tonight. You're the reason we are here. You are our God. We are your people. We pray in your name. Amen. Sing, 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 and make music with a heaven. We will sing, sing, sing. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your praise. Kingdoms bow down, Son of God, you are the one, you are the one, you are the love that frees us, you are the light that leads us, like a fire burning, Son of God, you are the to be able to lift up our voices, shout his name, sing his name, the name above every name, every name. Amen. Um, before you uh, mingle a bit, I would like to take this opportunity to wish a happy birthday to the queen of our church. She's not the queen of heaven, by the way. Just the queen of our church. So, um, I think she deserves a song, don't you think? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sherry. Happy birthday to you. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every year with Jesus, we love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps us, and he's the one we're waiting for. Every year with Jesus is sweeter than the year before. 
and many more. Give her a hug. Jesus, Jesus, one touch of your hand, I am healing, I am whole. Jesus, Jesus, one glimpse of your face brings fire to my soul and Jesus I come beholding your face I am changed glory to glory now I of your life brings glory to my soul. Jesus, Jesus, from darkness to light, my life overflows. flowing down and Jesus I come beholding your face I am changed glory to glory now I Your life brings glory to my soul. Jesus, Jesus, I am you and I am whole. of your face brings fire to my soul and Jesus I come beholding your face I am changed glory to glory now I see Of your life brings glory to my soul. Jesus, Jesus, from darkness to light, my life overflows.
Beholding your face, I am changed from glory to glory. Now I see, now I know. One touch of your life brings glory to my Father, we want to thank you for our time of worship and praise and adoration, God, a special time, Lord. And we thank you that we are able to come and gather on Wednesday night, Lord God, the middle of the week where we can be fed and, Father, we can fellowship and you can love on us and we can love on you, Lord God. So we ask for your blessing on the time of the Word of God, Lord, that you would teach us if there's ever been a time we need the knowledge of the Holy One, we need the wisdom of God, it's today, Lord. So give us wisdom and understanding, God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Book of Proverbs, chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, Proverbs chapter 10. Chapter 10 changes a little bit the book of Proverbs. We will see individual Proverbs. Most of these individual Proverbs are contrasts, or they are contrasting the wise with the foolish, or the wicked with the righteous, or the diligent with the slothful. <clears throat> So you're going to see a lot of individual Proverbs tonight. So let's start on verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. So the first thing that Solomon speaks about is a wise son that makes a glad father. Again, this w word wise means learned, shrewd, prudent. And I think that Solomon is speaking this because he believes he's a wise son. At this point, Solomon is wise. He's walking according to the word of God. He has learned from his father, David, and he has applied the word of God to his life, and his life has been blessed and prospered. And I have no doubt that he has seen his father, David, smile upon him. I don't think that, <clears throat> well, I have four sons, and there's no doubt in my mind that when your sons make wise choices, when they live according to the word of God, when they're prudent, it makes a, a, a dad's heart glad. 
without a doubt. It makes a, a heart rejoice. When our children make wise choices, it, it's, it's awesome. But I want to remind you, because I'm reminded it myself, when it comes to my grandchildren, I still have an influence on them. That our children make wise choices many times because they see us make wise choices as they're growing up. And they also, as we know in Deuteronomy, it speaks about we are to teach our children the ways of God and how to walk with God, to write the Word of God on the tablets of their hearts. But now that we're older, <clears throat> what do we do concerning the influence of our children, or our grandchildren, especially since we're distant and they're grown up now. I believe we pray for them more than anything else, and we ask God to work in their hearts, to give them wisdom, to counsel them, for them to have a love for the things of God. And I think that's what we need to do. And I believe in time, God will answer, God will work, and it will make our hearts glad or rejoice. But listen to what the second half of this scripture teaches. <clears throat> but the foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Now, mothers, raise your hand if this is true. We know the Bible, without a doubt, is true. No ifs, ands, and buts. And without... a question... A mother never stops being concerned about their children. Never, I don't believe a mother should ever give up on their children. But a foolish son, without a doubt, will bring heaviness to a mother. But I want to read to you with this word foolish, because a lot of times we think that foolish means, well, you know, they're a dumbbell. They're uneducated, they're not su su successful in any way. But that's not what it means at all. It means a simpleton, and that word simpleton, if we remember last week, we, that word means not to be a dummy, but one to be not real simple. He doesn't know a lot. He's not well educated, so to say, when it comes to the things of God. It is also means an arrogant one. I know it all. I can't learn. I can't grow. You can't tell me anything, Mom. I already know it. And I think all of our children come to that point when they're like 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And if they're older than that and they're in that point, they're in trouble. They're set in stone. Now... Some children don't even realize what they can do to their parents. Amen? I guess just like we didn't realize it when we were younger. <laughs> now, we don't need to let sorrow consume us if we will pray for our children and release them to God. Every night before I go to bed, I release my children to God, but every morning... <clears throat> I get to pray for my children. I get to pray for my grandchildren. My granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, she's, as you know, she's 19 years old. And she called me the other day, and um, she called me, yes. And we talked for quite a while, when my wife and I. And she went back to get her second part of her freshman year. And she said, Papa and Grandma, really pray for me this second semester. And I, it was so nice to hear that. And I said, sure, we pray for you every day. But I've learned, and it's a selfish prayer partly, to release my children to God every day and every night, my grandchildren, 
Because when I release him to God, I leave him in God's hand, and God can do something with him, and it's up to God. Then I don't carry the weight of my children and my grandchildren. I do the same thing with the church and many people in the church. There are people in our body today who are sick. Tony's one of them. And I pray for her on a regular basis, but I'm concerned, but I'm not overwhelmed and overweighted because of it. And that's so important. We have no control over our children, a lot of us anymore, because they're too old and making decisions on their own, and some of the decisions are not good. Same thing with our grandchildren. And some of them are doing foolish things, and they can weigh heavy on our heart big time. They can crush our life. And the Bible teaches us that we need to commit them to God in prayer. That's the best thing we can do for them. Now, it goes on to the next verse. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing. But the righteousness delivers from death. So it's saying here, Gain that is made through wickedness doesn't profit at all. I want to read a different translation in the same scripture. This is in the New Living Translation. It says, Ill-gotten gain has no lasting value, but right living can save your life. Two thoughts. Number one... <clears throat> God wants us to be honest in everything we do. God never wants us to get things wrongfully. Ill-gotten gain has no value. But the Bible teaches in that second part of that scripture, but right living can save your life. Being right with God brings a benefit many can't buy, our money can't buy. I can't tell you how important that we live right as Christians. The Bible specifically tells us all over the place that it's important that we walk with God and we live the right way. We live in integrity, we live in love. We live according to the scripture, not because we have to, because, but, we, but because we can. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and God's given us the ability to live the way he wants us to live, that we may be salt and light. But also, we live that way because we love God, but also it will save us from death. I can't tell you how many sins have killed so many young people young. Today they are dealing with fentanyl. It costs five dollars a tablet. And I watched an interview with a man, and he said this. He said, before I take my fentanyl and I buy it, I asked who I'm buying it from, is it safe? Because I don't want it to kill me. It really doesn't make sense in a way. Because the guy that's going to sell him that doesn't care if it kills him or not. He just wants his five bucks. If there's ever been a time that righteous living needs to be among our youth, it's now. Because death can happen so easily now to them in so many ways. Verse 3. <clears throat> The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casts away the substance of the wicked. So in other words, those who walk in righteousness, in other words, walk the right way that God calls us to walk in, to walk out the righteous people, not self-righteous, but righteous according to the way God wants us to live, the way that God wants us to think, by the power of the Spirit of God, 
will not famish. In other words, will not hunger. <clears throat> As a Christian, God has given us the spirit of the living God to live in us, which enables us to be who God wants us to be, to overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. And God wants us to have the fruits of his spirit. God wants our life to be full, have meaning and purpose. But there are things that stop us from that. And probably the number one thing that stops a person from being fulfilled or not suffer hunger, so to say, spiritually, is when one walks in the flesh. I know we look at the enemy of the as a devil, and he is an enemy. But I don't believe that he steals, robs, and kills as much, because he does do that, the Bible teaches, as much as the flesh does concerning Christians. The most miserable people in the world are not the non-believer. They're miserable. They're dead. They don't know. They're dead. A dead person doesn't know. But as those who have once walked and tasted God and see how good he is, who have tasted the Spirit of God, the joy and the peace of love of the Spirit of God and the fruits of the Spirit of God, and then walked away and allowed their flesh to take over their own life and live by the flesh, they are the most miserable. And they suffer famish. They are hungry and thirsty constantly. They search and they put in things that are empty, but it only makes them empty. That's how it works. But those who walk righteously, the Bible says, God will not allow them to hunger. Now, he says he casts away these desire of the wicked. Verse 4, <clears throat> he becomes poor that deals with the slack hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. So it speaks about those who become poor and what causes them to become poor. Not all poor people this is true of, but many of them it is true of. Those who deal with become poor because they are a slack hand. Slack hand literally means to be lazy or slothful. In other words, whatever, I'll do it tomorrow. But the hand of the diligent makes rich. hard work and prosperity also come to those who work hard. Our generation, I believe, were taught how to work. And I can't emphasize the importance and I've done this with my children. I taught them how to work, by example, but I also taught them how to have chores. They had to do something every single day. They had chores. And I've asked my children to teach their children how to work. There are many children today, 18, 19, 20, 21, up to the age of 40 that live with their parents and live with their grandparents. They don't work. 
they allow the parents, or the parents allow their children to more or less use them, take advantage of them. And they're not loving their children or their grandchildren that they think they are by letting them live with them and not work. They're hurting them. They're enabling them. When you see somebody that prospers, and I'm not talking about wicked men, I'm talking about men in general, or women in general, is because they work hard. They're not lazy. One thing that is noted in Proverbs in the Bible is that God does respect and desire that in your business dealings you always be absolutely honest and upright. Don't be trying to always be a shyster with other guys or take advantage of another guy. And he speaks against that kind of stuff. He who deals with a slack hand. Deal honestly. Don't deal with a slack hand. Be diligent. You'll become poor that deals with a slack hand. It'll come back to you. You won't stay in business a very long, but if you're honest and diligent in your business, then you're going to get a reputation for that. You cannot keep your reputation from getting around. It'll either be good or bad. Now, he goes on in verse 5, and again, he says something a little bit different. He that gathers in the summer is a wise son, and he that sleeps in the harvest is a son that causes shame. We are to work when there's work. Solomon uses the analogy of a vineyard, possibly, that is now ready for harvest, but the man is too lazy to harvest. I want you to think about this for a second. <clears throat> think of the, uh, an animal or an insect that when it's time to gather, it gathers. Probably the greatest animal that I see are the insect, I think it's an insect, is the ant. They have no leader, but they all work together. And they work and work and work and work all summer to save for the winter. And this is what the Bible is teaching. The Bible gives a good story about this. It's a story about a man named Joseph. We know all the things that happened to Joseph, but after all those trials that God allows in his life, God puts Joseph in the place of the second most powerful person in the world at, at that time. He becomes the prime minister of Egypt, and his sole job is to, during the seven years of plenty, to harvest and put away for the seven years that will be bad. God uses Joseph and goes before Joseph, and he uses Joseph to save his people, and in that he saves a lot of the world. We can learn a truth with our personal lives. There's going to be times in your life that you're going to be able to harvest and save. So when you get older, you can't do as much, you can't work as much, and you can retire. I recently heard of a man, 80 years old, he couldn't retire. How's it a man that works all his life at 80 years old not be able to retire? There's something wrong with that picture. Now, verse 6, blessings are on the head of the just, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. 
blessings are on the head of the just. So who is a just person? And what does this word mean, just? Because we want to know the kind of people that God blesses. And let me say to you, before I share with you what this word means, God wants to bless every single person. But there are certain things that cause us not to be blessed by God. Let me read this word to you, then I'll tell you the opposite. This word just means conduct and character. Conduct and character. Righteousness as justified and vindicated by God, correctness and lawfulness. So following the law, living correctly, speaking correctly, talking correctly, these are the ones that God blesses. And the word blessing means prosperity, our blessings and the praises of God. In other words, God says you're a blessing to him and his kingdom. A good example of that is when Jesus in the, was in the transfiguration. And God the Father said, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. That's what it's talking about. I want to live the way God wants me to live. Not to just become prosperous. But I want to do that because I, I want to please God the Father. That's so important. In pleasing God the Father, I am not asking God to give me this or give me that, and I'll do this because you give me this or give me that, or you do this or do this or that for me, God. That's not what I'm talking about in any way. My blessings are on the, on the head of those of, of the just, those who live right. And I see that happening in so many Christian lives. So many Christians in our church are blessed by God. They're older men and older women, the older couples. They walk with God. And you can see the hand of God upon them. But listen to what the second part says. But the violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Two thoughts. Violence comes out of the mouth of the wicked. And that's true. Or violence will come to the wicked. It might be both. Now I want to read this word to you. Violence, it means cruelty or injustice. Verse 7, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall, be, shall rot. Think that one over. How do you want people to remember you? Or what do you want them to think about you? when you're gone. The Bible makes a promise that the memory of the just will be blessed. But if you've been rotten, your name will rot. He goes on in verse 8. Those in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. The wise in heart, it says here, will receive or lay siege of, or it's the same word that a, a man takes a wife. It'll become part of him. So a wise man will receive commands. So what are the commands that the Bible is talking about? We know in the Old Testament it's a little different than the, the New Testament, but it's still, they're still covered by two commandments. So God tells us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first commandment. And the second commandment is like it. To love your neighbor 
like you love yourself. Well, the Bible says here that the wise will lay hold of the commands. Whatever God commands me to do, I will grab it and I will be like marrying it like I do my, did my wife and become one with it. It'll be part of me. And this is so important. But it says about a prating fool, shall fall or go to destruction. The padding fool in the Hebrew is called a fool of lips because he speaks rashly, hastily, or recklessly. I can't tell you the importance because we'll talk about this and the Bible talks a lot about this in the book of Proverbs about the mouth of people. Let me remind you, I can tell the temperature of a person's heart by what, they, by what comes out of their mouth. I can tell where they are with God by the way they, what comes out of their mouth, what they speak. The Bible says, out of the heart flow all the issues of life. A prating fool, the Bible speaks. Speaks hastily or recklessly. Verse 9. He who walks in integrity walks securely. And he who perverts his way will become known. So here the Bible speaks about a, a man who lives. That's what the word walks mean. Regular life with integrity. And then makes a promise that he'll be secure. The word integrity literally means innocence, soundness, wholeness, uprightness, and honesty. Reputation is what one says about you. Character is how you are in your heart. So a man who walks or lives in, with integrity, one who is honest, one who has nothing to hide, he does not live a double life, That person is secure from fear or anxiety. He is kept safe by God. But he who perverses his way will become known. The word perversely means make crooked, twists, or distort. And that is because of the way that he lives. It will be revealed. It only takes time. Time always tells, I believe. Verse 10 speaks, He that winks with his eye causes sorrow, but a prating fool shall fall. Wink with his eye, one who does not take wickedness serious. Verse 11. The mouth of the righteous, man is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. So it's speaking here about a righteous man it will be like a well of life. In other words, he'll speak life-giving words. But violence covers the mouth of the wicked. The wicked man brings pain and sorrow with his words. 
and they take away life. Verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but, but, but love covers all sins. Constant stirring up of strife and controversy is evidence of hatred. Hatred always brings trouble. But the Bible teaches here, but love covers all sins. It forgives, it forgets, and it overlooks. It doesn't agree with it. It doesn't say it's right. This is quoted in the New Testament where we are told, but love covers a multitude of sins in 1 Peter 4, 8. Hatred, if you're filled with hatred, it's just going to stir up strife. Everybody going to hate you. But if you're a loving person, they're willing to overlook your faults. Martin Luther wrote this. It is impossible to keep peace between men and women in a family like if they do not condone or overtake each other's faults or overlook, I'm sorry, each other's faults, but watch everything to the smallest point. For who does not at times offend? This is by Carl Windsor. He writes, even the most devout couple will experience a stormy bout once in a while. A grandmother celebrating her golden wedding anniversary once told the secret of her love and happy marriage. On my wedding day, I decided to make a list of 10 of my husband's faults, which, for the sake of our marriage, I would overlook, she said. A guest asked the woman, what were some of the faults she chose to overlook? The grandmother replied, I'll tell you the truth, my dear. I never did get around to making the list. But whenever my husband did something that made me hopping mad, I would say to myself, lucky for him, that's one of the ten. <laughs> Smart woman, huh? Now, verse 13. On the lips of him that has understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him who is devoid, a void of understanding. For the words they speak reveal the wisdom they possess. Verse 14, wise men lay up knowledge. But the mouth of fools is near destruction. So how do we lay up knowledge? I believe the most knowledgeable book that there ever was for man and ever is or ever will be is the Bible. I believe that God wants us to read the Bible every day. I believe that God wants us to memorize the scripture, to run it over in our head and in it over in our mind. I want to remind you what the Bible says, that it washes and cleanses us, that the word of God is more sharper than a two-edged sword, and it cuts to the dividing of the heart, that it reads your motives, what you think and what you don't think, when you're thinking right and when you're thinking wrong. So how do I lay up knowledge on how to deal with life or deal with circumstances? I read the scripture. I see how God handled things. I memorize. Verse 15, the rich man's wealth is his strong city, but the destruction of the poor is their poverty. So the rich man, and I don't think that this is every rich man, I think there are Christians who are rich men, 
rich women who love God, who don't depend on just their riches, but they depend on God. But there are many rich people today who believe that their wealth is more important and that's going to protect them more than anything else. And the SPV Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, collapsed. There were so many people that were freaking out. The lines were long. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do some freaking out when your money's going to be all gone with that possibility. And there may be, they say there's 186 banks are having problems right now that can collapse. They say there's a possibility that they're going to all accumulate in four banks for the government to control them. And that would be an end time scenario without a doubt. But God never wants us to be in a place of where we depend on our wealth or what we have in the bank to trust in. Because that can be here today and gone tomorrow. Does that mean God doesn't want us to be wise with what he's given us or made us stewards of? No, that's not what I'm saying either. But my trust is not in what I can touch, but it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Now he goes on in verse 16, the labor of the righteous leads to the life, but the wages of the wicked to sin. So when I do my labor as unto God, because that's what we're supposed to do, we do everything as unto the Lord, not unto man, not unto our boss, not unto anyone else, but as unto God, it will lead us to life. In other words, our life will be full. But the wages of the wicked to sin. So wickedness has a reward, sin and judgment. Verse 19, he who keeps instruction is in the way of life, but he who refuses correction goes astray. This is probably one of the most simple scriptures in the Bible, but a lot of people don't heed it. So he observes or keeps instruction is in the way of life. That's the way of life. This is the way that God wants us to be. This is the path that God wants us to lead. This is a narrow path that God wants us to be on. That's how it works. But he who refuses correction goes astray. If you've been a Christian for a period of time and you said yes to God in the sense of I want your will, whatever that may be, then you are in the place of knowing that until the Lord takes you home or the rapture happens in your, all of our lives, you're going to need correction. There's no person in the world today who's beyond correction. But in this verse, it speaks about the importance of it. But he who refuses correction goes where? Astray. In other words, they walk away from God. They walk away from God's truth. Maybe they not, may not walk completely away from God. They just might do something that will affect their life for the rest of their life. That's wrong. 
because they wouldn't receive correction. None of us know it all. None of us have arrived. We all need correction. We all need instruction. But let it be known to you tonight that if you come to a place of where you will not receive correction, then you have the great possibility of straying from God and from God's will in your life. Now, I like this scripture, but I don't like it. He who hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. In other words, those who hate in their heart will bring forth lying lips. There are people who say they love you, and there are going to be people in your life who say they love you. But if they lie about you, the Bible teaches here that they really hate you. That's a pretty strong statement. But the Bible knows what it's talking about. The second part of the scripture, whoever spreads slander is a fool. The word slander means defamation, evil report, or whispering. Now, have I ever done that before? Has any of you ever done this before? Have you ever said something about another person, given an evil report? Every one of us have. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you concerning the same thought. Slander, Numbers 13, 32. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land to which we have gone as spies into the land to devour its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. Now this is a little bit different, but it is still a bad report. God wanted to take him to the land. He had promised to Abraham years, hundreds of years before. And God told him to send 10 spies out, and they, did, I'm sorry, 12 spies out, and they did. And they were there for 40 days. And when they came back, they bring clusters of grapes that one cluster, two men had to carry. And they said, the land is blessed, without a doubt. But there are too many giants and too many big walls, and it's too hard. We can't do it. There's no way that we can do it. What they were really saying is, God's not big enough to give us the victory. And so they turned the whole congregation, and that's why this bad report caused them over six million I'm sorry, not six million, over 600,000 men alone would die in the wilderness because of this bad report. And there are people, even Christians, that can give God's word a bad report. Well, that didn't work for me. I tried it. Usually, God's word will fail, not because... God's word fails because people usually have faith in their faith and not faith in the living God. Our faith is in the person of the, of the Bible. It's not in my faith. Let me give you another scripture. This is in Numbers 14, 14, 36. Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who turned and made all the common grace complain against him bring a bad report in the land. Numbers 14, 37, those were very men who brought the evil report about the land, died by the plague before the Lord. Let me share this story with you. There's a story in the Jewish Talmud about a king who sent two jesters to an Aaron, or an, on an Aaron. In instructing them, he said, Foolish Simon, 
Go and bring me back the best thing in the world. And you silly John, go and find me the worst thing in the world. Both clowns were back in a short order, each carrying a package. Simon bowed low and grinned. Behold, sire, the best thing in the world, his package contained a tongue. John snickered and quickly unwrapped his bundle. The worst thing in the world, another tongue. We need to be careful with what we speak and how we give bad reports, and we need to be careful about speaking against the Word of God or the truths of God. The Bible says in Psalms 141, to set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep a door over my lips. In the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 37, it says this, But I say to you, for every war, idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. It's a sobering thought as a Christian. It's a sobering thought as a person that every word that I speak, especially as a pastor, I'll be more accountable for what I teach. I'll give an account to God for. Let me say this to you. If you will keep that in your heart, you'll say a lot less words, without a doubt. Because you'll know that God is writing them down, and He is. So be careful. Verse 19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. For some people, beloved, the more they talk, the more they sin. Some people say, I just I am, I can't shut up. I know a friend of mine who has a shirt that says on the front of it, help me, I just can't, I can't shut up. <laughs> and there are some people like that. But in time, if you talk and talk and talk, first of all, nobody's going to want to be around you. And number two, you are going to sin. The more chances you speak, the more chance you have to sin as you speak more. Verse 19, in the multitude of the words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Better to keep your mouth shut and let people think you're a fool than rather than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Verse 20, the tongue of the just is as cherry silver, full of goodness and benefits. That's what that means. The heart of the wicked is little worth. Verse 21, the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. The first part of this verse, God's words of life come from the righteous, those who walk with God. They, the, the words of life come from them, truth. Their counsel is God's counsel, which will bring life. Their seeds that bring life. But fools die for one of wisdom, and that's because they reject wisdom. That's what fools do. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Or, I know, I know. I've heard people say that. You tell them something. I know, I know. I, this is my thoughts. You do? You know, but you don't, you're not doing, you're doing exactly the opposite of what you're saying, you know. Verse 22, the blessings of the Lord, it makes one rich. And adds no sorrow with it. 
You know, I found it to be true, especially as you get older, you recognize and you realize that the greatest riches that you receive are from God. It is the peace that God gives you. It is the mercy that God brings to your life. It is the love, especially the love that God brings that makes one rich. It goes on in the Romans 10, verse 23. It is a sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding has wisdom. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. The wicked knows they are not right. God puts a conscience in them, and they will have to one day give an account. It makes them afraid. Sometimes you look at people and you see the things that they've done, the crimes that they've committed, and you would think they have no fear of judgment at all. But the Bible teaches differently that they do have a fear. They will know, and they do know, that one day they'll stand before God. But the desire of the righteous will be granted. In the book of Psalms 37, verse 4, it says this, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. God will, as we get our satisfaction and joy from him, will give us the desires of our hearts because the desires of our hearts will be his desires. Verse 25, as a whirlwind passes, but the wicked is no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. In other words, they'll never be moved, those who walk in rightly before God. The others who are wicked will be unstable, here today and gone tomorrow, no foundation. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes is a sluggard to them who sends them. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Does that mean that God's going to give us long life, our prolonged life, if we fear God? Possibly. And possibly not. It's up to God. God numbers our days. Verse 28, the hope of the righteous shall be glad, are happy. But the expectation of the wicked shall perish. In other words, their expectation will be lost. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. So God's path is blessed, and good will follow those who walk in God's path. That's the way of the Lord. It's strength. It'll bring strength to you. Verse 30, the righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall inhabit, not inhabit the earth. The righteous are secure and unmovable, in other words, being founded on the rock. Verse 31, two more verses. The mouth of the just, those who are righteous, brings forth wisdom. In other words, they know what to say and when to say. But the forward tongue shall be cut out of the perverse tongue. And verse 32, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable. In other words, they know what God says and what God accepts and what God does not accept. But the mouth of the wicked speaks forwardness, perversity of perverse things. We're going to stop there tonight. Father, we are grateful for the word of God, Lord. We're thankful, Lord God, that, Father, you have given us words of life, words of truth, Lord God. 
And Father, we've seen this in our lives personally. We've seen it, Father, where it's been blessings, and we've seen it, Lord, Father, when it's brought forth bad fruit, Lord. So our prayer tonight is that, Father, we would desire you more, hunger more for your word, God. And if there's anything, Lord, we need to turn away from, God, concerning slander, concerning, Father, hatred, Lord God, Father, not willing to be corrected or instructed or teachable, Lord. Forgive us, Lord God, and cleanse us, Lord. And Father, give us a fresh fire of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill us with your power and might, Lord. And give, her a, give us a hunger for the Word of God, Lord. We thank you for all the best lessons you've bestowed upon us, Lord. We serve an awesome God. And Father, we may, may we never have another brother or sister question your word in the sense of, Father, by distorting it, Lord, or giving or bringing up a bad report, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.